Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to this um, ILI uh, seminar or talk that you guys from are going to give this afternoon. Grab some food quickly if you haven't already. Um, you can eat while we're talking. Um, does anyone know what the ILI is? The Inspired Learning Initiative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you all pretty much know what it is. You're going to find out today anyway what it is. So. Um, it's an exciting time to be a teacher, I think, at UNSW. There's a lot of um, support at the moment for what they call the digital uplift um, as we go into the tri semester in 2019. So it's a, it's a very exciting time, I think, um, to have a look at your teaching and to um, uh, have a look at how technology can really enhance learning. Um, I'm not going to talk very long. I've just got a couple of actually announcements to make. Um, I think most of you have met Danny already. Dan, Danny's over here. So Danny, yeah. So Dan, not Danny, sorry. Danny with a Y. Danny with a y. Um, so Danny is now part of uh, the learning and teaching team here. And as you know, Patrick's uh, moved into a, a different role. So if you have anything that you used to go to Patrick for, please now go to Danny yes. and Patrick. <laughs> And Patrick um, is taking a new role. And Patrick's role now is uh, really preparing courses for the tri trimester. And so that'll be realizing courses, uh, general digital uplift, producing materials for courses um, as we go into 2019. And then Danny's going to do turn and stuff, setting up any activities, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I just want to just say a few things, a couple of things. We've got a new website coming out at the end of this week, which is going to help, hopefully, all the academics here in just uh, thinking about how they can actually go through with this digital uplift and using technology in their teaching. Um, so the website will look at uh, you know tools we can use, the Moodle tools we can use, strategies and technologies uh, using and using those tools. We'll have a look at what some people are already doing at the law school, some really good work that's already been happening. And if you're a newbie, we've got a section there, and also just uh, general resources for teachers. There'll be some articles, um, that kind of stuff. So this hopefully will be a really good resource for everyone to use. It's faculty or university? Faculty, right. law faculty is for us. Um, and within the strategies, for example, you know, there's like big ideas for online learning, what does it actually mean, uh, and some ideas there. How are we going to do digital content creation? So there'll be a lot of information about that kind of thing. Online assessment and marketing very important at the moment. It's a lot of clips going digital. A lot of people are using Turnitin um, to give back marks and also to market it. It seems to be very effective. Um, we're looking at studio and studio software. How can we uh, utilize our studio, which we built in the last year, to create a lot of the content and using technology in the classroom, in the actual classroom, walking around with the tablet. And doing that kind of thing. And then um, another important area I think is also online collaboration and communication within uh, the middle of the technology. The, the other thing we're really embracing at the moment, Patrick is really embracing, is a thing called Smart Sparrow. I'm, just, I'm not going to explain it right now, but I just want to chuck out the word Smart Sparrow so you, you'll start to hear it a lot in the next few months. Um, what we can do with Smart Sparrow. It's a fantastic tool for create, uh, delivering material to students. So instead of just having a PDF or a Word document sitting on your Moodle site and you have a little thing underneath saying, please read this week in the class, we can now put a lot of that information into Smart Sparrow and we can also put uh, questions for students to um, answer as they're looking at the materials. We can, we can stagger those questions through the material, we can break up the material and, um, really make it dynamic, more dynamic for the, for the students. So for example, this one is look at these reports and then write something in here. It's automated in the sense that um, you don't have to really check what the students are writing because we can, if the students click next, they'll get automated feedback about what the answer should be and then they can just go back to their own um, answer and go, hmm, I'm a little bit off or you know, I, I answered that perfectly. So we're using it in that way. Um, and another way you can embed videos um, and then put, you know, again, these answers in here or these questions and answers in here. It's a really good tool. We're at this stage of using it. It's actually much more advanced than that because we can start to do branching 
um, scenarios and conditional learning where the students click on one thing and then they, um, can, uh, if they get wrong, they go in one direction, if they get right, they go in another direction. So, and that can be very, very complex. So this is a great way to um, deliver material to students. Um, the other amazing thing that's just come up in Moodle in the last month or so, which is an absolutely fantastic tool for um, teaching online, is we can now add <coughs> questions directly to a video. So if you've got a video, we can uh, edit that video to chuck a question in. So right here, the video's in the background here. I'll put a question in here. The students can check it. They get some feedback. It, it gives them... Um, they can really focus in on the video and the content of the video by um, making them stop and think about certain cool ideas within the video. So this is a, this is a really fantastic thing. And that's it from me. Um, so if you have any questions about that, come see Thomas, Patrick, and now Danny in our team. And uh, as I said, it's a really exciting time. I think the next 18 months is going to be really fun and um, full of work. <laughs> Danny and Mark. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Are you going to put the PD up? Come on, Ben. Just for introductions, uh, I'm Mark King. Go ahead, Danny. So, <laughs> please, not. Um, I'm Mark King, Director of Education Delivery Services in the portfolio of PBC. We were the authors of the Inspired Learning Initiative, which is a $77 million internal grant for the next five years of work. Um, inside of our team is um, senior manager Danny McGuire, um, PhD in neuroscience, minds in psychology. Um, we, again, it looks like a team too. We have a, a large piece of work across um, the Inspired Learning Initiative, but the main one we're going to talk about today is the digital uplift. But if I can go through it, um, the Science Education Academy, if you're familiar with the SEA. So we have 15 fellows doubling up to 30 fellows in 2018. Some of the peer review process, have you heard about that yet? That's something that's coming out of the Academic Development Services within PBCE to look at um, peer review. Director of First Year Experience is Professor, Professor Richard Buckland. You've heard about this, looking at enhancing first year experience so we can tap into that team for um, first year, first and second year courses. Digital assessment system is run by Professor Phil Jones from Medicine, looking at digital assessment and capabilities around the university. Online community app is UCRU, which has been rebranded as UCO which is being piloted in AGSM and business right now. It's a, an app that, um, it's a Facebook-like app that the students can use in, in collaboration with Moodle. And then students as partners, um, it's a, another set of funding, but when we get to the digital uplift, we have a, a large set of funding where we can identify students, undergrad or postgraduate students, to come into the co-design and development of resources for your courses. And then finally, the digital uplift is uh, 330 blended and 330 fully online courses over the next five years, actually over the next four years. We're finishing the first piece of work right now. Ben's familiar with all this from the ADE meetings with Professor Crisp and, and myself. Um, the team, John, you guys all know John, right? John Village, do you want to stand up, John? Okay. Yeah, Manager of Education and Planning and Development, and Ingu is one of your graduates. And now Hassan is joining us next Monday. I think somebody might know Hassan. Yeah. <laughs> right. So part of our part of the initiative is we've um, and Danny will go at this a little bit later. We're appointing UNSW PhD or JD graduates to deploy back into faculties where they were from. We think that's a highly effective way for doing design and development. Uh, you come across this science education experience. From PBCE, it's um, four pillars of communities, feedback through dialogue, inspired learning through inspired teaching, and being digital. We're embedding these four pillars into our design piece through the digital uplift, and it's a major component of how we see uh, educational enhancement moving forward. Done? Or me? Yes, so over Danny, please. So the Digital Uplift, we have a goal of designing, developing, uh, deploying, and also evaluating 660 online and blended courses, um, 330 online and 330 blended um, online, and 330 blended courses. And the whole purpose of it is to provide the unique, personalized, flexible education offerings and experience to our learners so we can enhance student learning experience. Within our PVC team, we have a um, cross-functional and multidisciplinary team, including discipline expertise, subject matter experts, 
educational technology, design, media, evaluation and analytics, and also curriculum design. So within our process of redesign courses with you, we have access to different experts within our portfolio where we can assist in the redesign of the courses. We have financial support, so budget for every course that goes through the digital update, there is a $30,000 budget, and 10,000 of this will go to the faculty, so this is used for teaching relief or getting a teaching assistant to assist in the course design. We also have $20,000 for course access, so this is the development of the course and all the different resources, activities, support and evaluation that you want to include in the course as well. The third component, so this is just an update from our first year of the Digital Uplift Program. We have 55 currently in progress, um, 10 of which we have completed already. And these are just the numbers from the different faculties. So we're uh, working with all the factories across the university to redesign their courses. 92 courses in 2017 are being redeveloped and double that number in 2018. So our goal this week, the year was actually 82, but we're exceeding our um, goal this year. And how do we do this? We do this through partnership with faculty staff, and also we like to encourage the use of the embedding of student partners within the course redesign. And we also have external collaborators, so we use a pool of freelancers. We have access to 2.1 million freelancers globally uh, to assist in course redesign, and also third party vendors and industry partners that we would be um, working with. And we also have the executive board within our um, digital Program. These are the, the this is the workflow, so summary of it. We first start off with the course nomination. So if you want to nominate your course for redesign, you just need to speak to the Ben. 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 So we've got a, we've got an expression of interest process here in the faculty which is open until the first of August. You just send uh, an email to the Law Education website and Rebecca Crosby is monitoring that. Um, uh, yeah, that's and once the courses get nominated, we do a quick um, viability assessment, so we reach out to the course conveners, learn a bit about the course and what you want to achieve. Based on that, we then make recommendations to go forward with the course design. We then have project initiations, that's where we sit with you, we kick off the course design. Mm -hmm. We get signed up by you as well that you want to engage with us and we put a timeline together. Um, once that gets activated, we do a pre-project survey. This is part of our evaluation process, so we want to know from your perspective what you think about course design. And once we do that, we have course review and scope of work. So we evaluate the course as it sits. Um, we look at student feedback, tutor feedback, and your feedback as well to see what parts of the course that you want to improve. We also have scope of work. So this is where we design the course. We basically have a blueprint of your course, what you want to change, what you want to include. And based on that, we can create the, the Moodle course. So we automatically create that from the design app that we've created that links up to Moodle. From that, we have cycles of design, development, and implementation. We have an iterative approach to course design, so you can see the product as it's evolving, so the product being your course. And once we do that, we have handover and training. So if there's any parts of the course that you require training, we ensure that you have training so you can sustain the course for the future um, delivery of that. We have project flows. This is where we sign off to say we've completed the course design with you. And once we've done that, we have the post-project survey and focus groups where we get your opinion on how the process went, your feedback on how we can improve as a, a central education unit to improve our services to you. When we say we, we actually mean you. It's your course. We're in a support role here. The team comes in to support what kind of modifications you think are appropriate for your course in the context. And we work forward to that. We do have th certain thresholds we need to meet, but that usually that's not an issue in any of the faculty who we're working with. And I'll hand over to John and Ming to go through some examples with you. All right. So we've been having a, uh, a trial of the um, uh, a new Moodle template. At the moment, we're running this template through uh, the gauntlet of um, usability testing. We've got two Moodle testers working all week, every week, um, testing the theme, looking for bugs and that sort of thing. Uh, this is an example of John Gilbert's um, revamped course. Um, uh, it is a, it's an example of some existing resources that we've um, improved. He had a whole series of podcasts um, in his course, and we, we got those podcasts, and we got, uh, we got them transcribed. 
um, and we also added images to them, and we, we put them into into his course and instead of just having the podcast link, something something that looks nice for, for John's course, um, and hopefully has has more usability for the students. Um, we're going to tee up some forum activities with this as well, so the students go into the podcast, have a listen, and go into a forum activity. Um, Um, there's lots and lots of tools for us to um, to use. Um, the important thing that that we that we promote is we don't use a tool for a tool stake. We really talk to conveners about different options and also um, and the most appropriate options um, for for your courses. Um, Lots of other options. So, for example, Thomas mentioned Spark Sparrow lessons. Um, there's we use inter, you know existing tools within Moodle where, where possible. We've got that great tool that Thomas mentioned where you can have uh, quizzes inside videos. So that's called H5P. Um, so that's an existing brand new tool. Um, and yeah, but we can do other things like image upgrades and simulations and video scribe animations. And I'll show you some examples of those as well. Um, again, back to Back to um, uh, Smart Sparrow. So Thomas mentioned Smart Sparrow earlier on. This is an example of um, the uh, Introducing Law and Justice um, Smart Sparrow module that we just, just made. Uh, it involved basically John Gilbert um, uh, writing the script for us. Uh, it goes over to Ning, and Ning, being having a law background, is able to review the actual, the actual script for the course. Give John, give John back some feedback. Uh, about the actual module. Uh, uh, we'll be also liaising with the uh, developer that are putting um, the content onto the SmartFarrow platform. And then we, once the developer has what we call the first draft or build, then we hand over to a designer that um, the skeleton of the, um, as you can see, this is what a designer is coming back for, for, uh, uh, for us in terms of design, but look at the feel of this course. Um, the uh, original skeleton is <coughs> look at Great as, as it looks now. So we put the designer, the design on, on top of the uh, first build. Then we give it to another coder to code the design onto the skeleton course. Then that course will be ready to release onto Moodle and get students enrolled into Moodle uh, site. The good thing about this is um, this is basically um, the sketch tree interpretation exercise embedded into the IRJ course. Um, this existing example crew binds uh, used for her book, The National Handgun Bag by Backpack. And so instead of student reading through, that's in addition to the student reading through the uh, page, the, uh, what do you call seven, eight pages of textbook information on that, they'll also be able to test their knowledge before they come to class, see um, how well they understand the, the, this uh, exercise or this issue or this um, statutory interpretation um, skills. And, um, and uh, uh, on the other side, for, uh, as a teacher or a lecturer's point of view, you will be able to see the students, how they performed uh, overall or in your uh, individual class, and also individual student, how they were doing it. And the potential for this is, this is uh, John has made this first um, uh, lesson, and there's three or four more he's uh, currently developing. Um, the first one is very basic, this minimum branch and the minimum um, uh, complexity. But um, as he's satisfied with the first lesson in the build, and he's developing a more complex one, for example, question bank. So what we, what we, what we want to do is identify students at different levels even before they come to class. Um, so uh, question bank is a, um, uh, a series of questions that you can feed into students, but not all of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to give the student the preliminary questions to, to determine their level of understanding uh, after they've completed their reading. And then the system will be able to identify a student's level and feed them different level of uh, uh, questions uh, in terms of level of uh, complexity and difficulty. So the students who, you know, your HD student would have, uh, wouldn't get the, uh, the basic content uh, support, they will get more, you will feed them additional information that they will be able to excel even further. For your struggling student, they will be able to get additional support, extra support in terms of understanding the basics of the topic. And uh, obviously, that's an example from other faculties as well. And this is uh, two of the current projects we're doing this year. One is with Justin Rogers um, for Lawyers, Ethics and Justice. And the other, the other one is Legal Writing Context, which is uh, a course that's uh, uh, tailored to international JD students uh, in their first semester. And 
what we did is, well, we're doing something interesting with, um, ped pedagogically with Justine's course. So, for example, uh, she partnered up with, um, what was that? Free Hills. Free Hills. Um, and so Free Hills, she partnered with Free Hills, they co-wrote a script. Um, pedagogically, we're using a concept called predict, observe, explain. Um, it's often like a, a concept used in the sciences where students look at an experiment, they predict what's going to happen, they, they observe what, ha what happens, and then they explain differences between what they predicted and what actually happened. Um, we, we're doing it uh, with uh, Justine's course in terms of a, um, uh, these, these solicitors, um, in terms of a, a case that they're looking at and whether they're going to be taken on a client or not. And so um, they've written a, a really comprehensive script that we filmed last week. Um, students are going to go in, they're going to have a look at one clip of the video, um, they're going to predict what's going to happen, they're going to, um, they're going to come, come to the seminar, they're going to observe what actually happens uh, during, during the case, and then they're going to go home after the, after the seminar and write up their, um, their explanation of you know, why their predictions didn't match up to what, what they actually observed. And they will have the benefit of the third video, which is the lawyer come up with the solution that they come up with in the real world situation and they will be able to compare the lawyer's solution and the student the, the solution student developed themselves and how how, how were they what, what issues they had covered uh, as a lawyer covered and um, uh, what issues that ne they neglect which the lawyer didn't yeah Dominic on the other hand um, being the uh, course has a high proportion of international students um, and he was really interested in uh, involving the student's voice in his actual course, an international student's voice. So for each uh, theme in his course, we actually wrote up a whole series of questions related to that theme, and then we interviewed um, current and past students um, on, on, their, um, on their responses to questions. So for example, one of the questions was, um, what were the differences, or uh, uh, what did you notice when you first visited a court in Australia, uh, as compared to your own countries, and things, things like that. So some really, really interesting questions to get that international perspective. Uh, we're also going to tee up um, some uh, forum activities for students. So once they watch these videos, they're going to go into a forum activity to you know share share their own experiences. Or even uh, given the new platform like H five P, we can even add the uh, questions into the video that as they, they, they watch the video. And the good thing is this um, uh, legal writing has um, I I took legal writing before, and it's a, it's a class that's very intensive for international students in their first semester. So the uh, the three hour per week obviously is not enough in terms of uh, teaching work. And so this uh, what we usually do, or um, uh, the lecture usually do, is they probably uh, they will have a, a court field day in week three and. Uh, for the last five or ten minutes of week uh, two's lecture, they will talk about what you need to watch out for, going to court and doing observation and what's the best practice, and which is very rushed. And they were always at the end of the seminar, three, three hour seminar, and it's very tired. So, what um, this video can do is extend the contact, the teacher or the uh, student contact online. So after they had the initial uh, introduction in class about what you, what you do in court and how to observe a, a, a court uh, proceeding, they will be able to watch past students talking about their experience, previous students uh, talking about their previous experience going to court and doing observation, what they have done well and what they wish they could do better. Nice. Um, oh, there we are, Kathy. <laughs> and so, so Kathy's course, we're drawing something interesting. Um, again, this is this is something interesting for law. It's called the light board. Um, we, we have it on campus in the Goodsell building or in the basement of it. Um, it basically looks looks something like this. It's basically a frame with a plate of glass, um, and basically we, we shine some LED lights. And um, if we just press play, there we go. Retail section down here. Now you don't have to know how to write back to front if we flip that in post-production. Um, but it's a really novel novel concept, especially for law, because things like this have oh, traditionally been used in the maths, the sciences, where you have instructors writing up equations and how you got those equations. But using law concepts, like for example, uh, the concept of stratum um, is, is, is a great, great approach. Um, from a uh, instructional perspective, a real, uh, from a design perspective, and development perspective, but really easy to produce these. So, for example, you can spend, uh, you can spend, how long did you spend, Kathy? Half an hour? Oh, yeah, probably 
half an hour? Yeah, half an hour. At the end of the half an hour, we just chop up the clips. Um, if you haven't made any mistakes, just basically <coughs> tops and tails, add some branding, and it goes into your course that day. So um, really easy, really quick production method, and the results look really good. And uh, a good potential use for this uh, live board, which um, we have a meeting with uh, <laughs> Marina. Get used to that. <laughs> um, what, after we had discussion with uh, lectures like Marina and um, other other courses we're doing this year, is it's a really good tool to explain pace, uh, complicated pace, uh, in terms of the facts. And instead of um, turning awkward back and forth on, uh, against the whiteboard, you will be able to look straight into students' eyes and listen and, uh, and uh, explain the complex facts of the case. That's one potential use of it. Yeah. Um, back, back to Cathy again. This is a, a mock-up for a, of a game that we're designing for, for Cathy as well. Um, so the game's going to be, we, we looked at a few options. We looked at play economics and then we've settled on Smart Sparrow for, for the design of this. This is quite interesting because it looks at uh, uh, you're going to be playing either a landlord or a tenant and you're going to be selecting uh, some leases and you're going to be selecting covenants. Uh, the reason that we chose a game format is because the selection of your covenants uh, for a particular lease um, uh, impacts later, later um, uh, it might impact you later on. Uh, for example, if you know, a disaster happens. And so um, it's going to be a really interesting um, game. At the moment, it's just in a mock-up that we're about to send to our uh, designers and developers to, to make for us. Um, other options that we have, we have a green screen room uh, that we can add any image to the background. We have um, option, you know, we have image subscriptions that, that we can supply for your courses. Um, add them into an actual course, build some content, build some activities around that, add transcripts to those as well. So, um, so lots of options in terms of multimedia. Um, and also something that, that's not that popular at the university at the moment, for example, we have um, Blackboard, um, a Blackboard Collaborate session or Blackboard Ultra, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Um, and it allows for basically web conferencing in, in your classes. So if there is a move towards you know um, fully online courses, this is a great great option of um, a, a great tool to use in your courses if you do want to do web conferencing. Um, looking at uh, a brief look at the future of, of what classrooms might look like. Um, this is actually what, what we have at the moment. So this is our um, iCinema. And if you press play. Menu, Yeah, so this, this is, um, if you haven't seen this before, it's, it's, it's called iCinema, where you have a class come into this round room and you're able basically to project 360 degrees. Um, it's a tool currently available to us all, and yeah. A good use of the I attended this um, information session, I actually went into this. Uh, a good use, potential I can see is uh, we can reconstruct the real core building. And that student have a where a 3D class and going there as if they're going to court and observe court proceedings. Cool. Now, another option that we have. So, um, Denny mentioned that we, we have access to freelancers, and this is one thing that we've been getting freelancers to make. So, these are called video scribes. So, they're basically interactive. Um, almost cartoon, cartoon videos. We actually, our hands will draw, we, we have artists around the world that will actually draw all these figures. So you have a concept that you really want to explain and you don't want to be in front of a um, light board. Um, and it creates really, they create really professional animations for us. So you actually see them, their hands creating these animations. Um, other tools that we use, like I mentioned, we try and use you know existing tools wherever possible. So, for example, good old Moodle quiz, um, but you know, um, uh, using using a, some images or videos in, in those H5P is what Thomas mentioned. So, some great interactive tools like quizzes within videos. Uh, other little tools, Lecture Recordings Plus is just coming out this semester as well, and um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra if you want some um, the web conferencing and. Um, yeah, now, like I mentioned, we've been trialling a, uh, a new Moodle theme. At the moment, we're, we're doing usability testing, we're doing Moodle testing on that particular theme. Um, and one of the benefits of the actual theme is, so basically, if you click on one of, the, um, one, one of the items or one of the artefacts in, in the actual theme, um, you're able to navigate to all the other items in the actual section there. So if you click on an item in the there section, you're able to see the navigation there. So it's a nice, cleaner-looking theme. And and um, yes, yeah, so stay tuned for that one.
Um, and obviously, um, with all the online resources we're building, they have to go hand in hand with the physical classrooms. And um, we, um, the PVC hopefully has been um, reactivating a learning space or trying to uh, reactivate the learning space by putting brand new technologies into that. And for the law, uh, they're converting two computer labs in the law library into active learning uh, spaces. And um, uh, in terms of, I think the, the tip is uh, when you book the classroom, you need to put in special requests. Say, I need an active learning space room. So your, your allocation will be prioritized for those who put the generic uh, room booking. And that, that slide also relates to um, how we design your courses. So we, we consider what students are doing before their seminars, but we also need to consider what happens during that seminar and how what they do before might change what they do in that in your physical time, because which is what we see as the most valuable time for students. Oh yeah, so we're, if we're, if we're looking for courses in 2018, so if you would like to put your course up for digital uplift, contact Ben, the expressions are interested in interest are out. How many are we looking for this year? Uh, 15 to 20 from this faculty to go forward for a 2018 start, so send those uh, expressions of interest through to the law education at unsw.edu. Uh, .au email address. Yes. Uh, send them up the hill. <laughs> as we mentioned, it's ten thousand dollars goes to the head of school for teaching release, and twenty thousand dollars for development resources for the course. We also have students as partners. So if you identify undergraduate or postgraduate students that you want to employ, it can come out of the twenty thousand dollars, or we have a separate funding pool for that. But we can get students to work on your course and co-design, co-develop with you. And it's a limited time offer, so see if it's Kathy's going to uh, showcase some of the work she's been doing for about 10 minutes and then uh, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions for, for everyone. Um, sorry, I'm actually not going to sort of show you, show, show you anything, I just wanted to, because uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing hasn't, hasn't yet been done to show you, I just wanted to, to, to do a general plug for the Inspired um, Learning Initiative. Um, the first thing just <coughs> in relation to things that people have been talking about, so the initial introductions of the um, the initial introduction that we had that Danny did um, before, I don't know anything about that, no idea, never seen it, and that's what's really good about this. So as the kind of person who would rather poke my eyes out with a hot stick than administer a um, ARC grant, for someone like me who just wants to do stuff, this is fantastic. So I have not seen any of that, I haven't done any of it, all I see is John and me, who are absolutely unreal, they have an average response time to emails of about two and a half minutes. <laughs> um, and it means that you can actually just get on and do stuff. So when you, the flowchart is great, and it's nice to know that that's all there, but you actually don't need to worry about that as an academic. You're not gonna, so you know, John just comes to me, here's the work thing, does this look right? You know, sign it, I'm a lawyer, I did read it. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's incredibly easy, so it's not a whole lot of administrative kind of buff to get to do with what you want to do. Um, it, it's given me what might be a tiny insight to what it's like to work in the private sector, where you sort of say something is done and you know you don't spend four hours standing at the photocopier doing your own photocopying, which is what being an academic is. So it, like me and John are fantastic, and that's a really, really good thing about this. You can just get um, stuff done, and they are incredibly responsive. Um, just going back, one of the things I think is really important about these things is this is not to do with technology, it's to do with teaching. And I think a lot of people are quite scared of this stuff because they think they're not technological. I'm not. I'm a middle-aged woman. Technology is not my natural habitat. I didn't grow up with it. I'm not particularly... I'm married to someone who works in IT, so I have intense learned helplessness when it comes to computers. I can't do anything. I don't know, actually understand where the internet comes from or how it gets to our house. So I am not technological at all. But this is about teaching. So it's about having ideas about teaching and then thinking about, okay, how can I maybe, how can technology help me teach better? Um, and just a few ideas, uh, just, you know, if I can uh, add to my list of heresies at UNSW Law School. I think casebook teaching is really out of date. I think it's quite misleading. Um, most of us know that modern law is not about cases, it's about statutes. And because we keep teaching through case books, I think we sometimes give our students quite a distorted concept of what law is. It's easier to teach through cases because they're actually interesting. Statutes are not that interesting. 
Um, but it is misleading. And we saw this really clearly this year when we did, we always do a statutory assignment for land law. Brendan wrote a brilliant little um, uh, problem on a, a share household in Kingsford. There we go, students can relate to it. A full quarter of our students failed to identify that there was a Residential Tenancy Act. And that's in fourth year. Now, our students are not stupid and they're not lazy. They are very hardworking and they are very bright. There is something going wrong in the perspective we give them in relation to statutes. Of the three quarters of students who did identify the Residential Tenancies Act, which was great, um, only about a quarter of them managed to identify that there was a section headed application of this act to share households. It's not very hard. That's the section heading. So I think that um, this technology stuff is a really important way that we can rethink teaching law because I'm really not convinced that casebook method is the best way of teaching modern law. Um, and ways of making statutes more interesting because they are dull. Um, you don't want to crawl through a statute in class. So coming up with ways of getting students to engage with statutes and the full range of law. law. The other thing about teaching law now is that most law is practised online. That's the reality. You deal with PDF documents all the time. Um, in land law in the area I work in, of course, the Torrens Register is, is a big computer thing in the sky, demonstrating how much I know about technology. Um, it's not a book anymore. Um, it's all online. It's really accessible. So one of the amazing things about technology for teaching, and I don't know how this relates to subjects that other people teach, the Torrens Register has the advantage of being publicly accessible. But I can provide students with huge range, a huge range of real documents. So instead of doing what probably we all did in law school, have some academic describe the implied covenants in a 19th century lease, which is completely irrelevant, I can actually give my students a real Lease. So I give them the Porto down the road because they might have eaten chicken there. I give them the Coogee Pavilion lease because it's kind of an exciting, groovy development they might have been to. I give them one Bly Street because it's a shit high-rise building that has law firms in it. And I give them one of the leases, long-term leases for um, Millers Point and has the great <laughs> thing on her sign on her door about the sale of public housing down there. So it's one of the long-term leases. And so instead of just describing <coughs> to students what a lease is, they can actually read a real lease and then you can set them, you know, you can create a quiz, make them answer it, those kind, and they're dealing with the real documents that they will see. This semester I did things, and these are just all sorts of ideas you can use technology for. This semester, instead of, you know, trawling through the law and mortgagee power of sale, which is not very hard, I auctioned a house in class. Um, I used a real house in Rosebury. I found it, it was being auctioned, I got the students to look at it. We looked at, I got the real title, um, and we actually held an auction in class, which is the, the kind of thing that I couldn't do without technology, so I couldn't show them the house, I couldn't show them the legal title without technology, but it's, uh, this is, uh, I think we've got what we call blended learning, but we actually auctioned the, the house in class, and then it sold the following weekend for about a million more than what we thought it was going to be. <laughs> 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 I got them to do things like draft an easement instead of again describing the case law, the 19th century case law on easements. I mean, they have to read it, that's fine, but I got them to draft an easement for an agri-board, actually draft an easement in class and upload it in class. So this, it, it's just about just changing the way we, we think, and I think really changing the way we think about casebook teaching. Um, I think the really important um, thing about me and John, it gives you a chance to try things. So we initially looked at possibly doing a version of Planconomics, which John mentioned. It turns out it's too expensive, it's too difficult, but the great thing about me and John is that they drive it. So we, I, I met with people in economics, they organised it all. We got to the point where we realised, not, not for us, but it was so much easier. It would have taken me, I'd still be trying to arrange to, to meet Alberto Motto if it was up to me. And it's done and dusted now because of John and me. Um, so the important, I think the good thing about this initiative is you can try stuff and if it doesn't work that's okay you try, and that's the thing with technology, you've got to keep trying. Um, I'll just finish on this, the last thing that I'm doing is I'm using the, some of the money that I've got directly, the $5,000 to employ a student, Adrian Aegis is one of our very technologically competent students, to look at the possibility of um, how to do an online textbook, which um, I'm one of the, as you guys all know, I'm one of the CNT Education Academy fellows and the other fellows are actually interested in this. Uh, legal publishers, I don't know about other areas, legal publishers are running scared. They are terrified because they know that students are going to want online textbooks and they don't actually have any ideas of their own. I was approached by Cambridge to do a textbook, as we all are, and I just thought to myself, A, very little academic credit, credit and I am, B, I am not giving you all of my ideas for you 
to pay me 10% of what you sell it to students for. That's, it's just so irritating. And the reality is that if we do online textbooks, we don't need publishers. Students aren't going to want to lug around a textbook that's that, that big. So uh, uh, one of the things, I, I, I'm not sure how feasible this is, but I think it's actually something for all, all UNSW academics that would be really useful if we work this out. Because if we had law school or UNSW branding for online textbooks um, that we and the university might be able to earn some money from, I think that that would be a really good thing to do. Because I think legal publishers are really, really worried, um, and for good reason. We could do much, much better innovative textbooks um, and get appropriate reward for them um, and they would be fantastic resources for students because really there isn't any need to have, well, there's an advantage to flicking through papers, there's no doubt about that, it can be quick, but there's all sorts of stuff that a textbook, hard textbook can never ever provide that an online textbook can, so interactive stuff, real documents, links to the internet, all those things, none of it gimmicky for very genuine pedagogical reasons to genuinely explain the subject matter to people much better than an old case would can. So, thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. Do you have any questions or comments or statements or...? <laughs> yeah, sure. I've just, I've just got one thing that I'll mention. something that comes with email. I've just got one thing that I'll mention from the back. Uh, I thought I saw people's kind of eyes light up when Mark mentioned that of the funding components, Mark King said for you, that um, the 10 grand that comes to the faculty, it comes to the, to the head of school, um, that can be used for teaching relief. That was the point at which I thought I saw people's eyes light up. Um, not to pour too much cold water on that, but just to remind people that the going rate for using money to buy out, uh, buy yourself out of teaching, teaching relief, is 17.5. Okay, uh, to buy you out of one class. Uh, and so the 10 grand doesn't get you um, the whole way there. It's absolutely a legitimate use of that money uh, to use it for that if you've got excess credits that can get you up to that point. Uh, but you also, you need to raise that explicitly in time with the head of school. Um, so that's just one thing uh, I would mention. Leave it private if you've got questions. Questions for the MC team or even for Kathy? Yes. Yeah, uh, just now, I, I think on the summary of the tools you mentioned about the simulation, but there's no example to demonstrate the simulation. <laughs> we don't have an example in law yet. <laughs> we have a lot of yeah. examples in other disciplines, such as engineering and medicine, because they use a lot of simulations or simulative environments to teach their students threshold concepts and uh, to practice by building. Yeah, we can organise a session where you can see other examples from different disciplines in terms of simulation, what they can interact with um, to simulate a real um, environment or case study. It's an example here, you can have a court and then there's different elements inside the court you can click on the judge which makes something happen, you can click on the juror, you can click on the lawyer, like that would be an example of something, like you've got a graphic with all the different people in the courtroom and then there's different interactive elements based on the activity you do with them. That's an example of a simulation, perhaps? And then, and then the choices you choose that, um, has an outcome that may be negative or positive. They use it a lot in medicine and, oh, and, the, mining, yeah, and the mining engineering. Um, the, the example I saw is that they simulate uh, how if a mine is not correctly set up or designed in terms of ventilation, explosion can happen. Also, can't let student into a real mine that has that default and let them observe the explosion in there. So, what we can do is get invite them to a simulation room and observe what's the consequence of that. Also, I think that the land law game that we're doing, that's meant to be a simulation in the sense that it's, that it's simulating the choices that real lawyers make. So you, you've got a client who's a tenant or a landlord, you've got to choose the right lease precedent, you've got to alter it accordingly, and then a fact scenario will change, and you better hope you've, you've chosen the right lease. So, you know, the tenant rips out the commercial kitchen, did you put a make good clause in the lease? Oh, no, you didn't. There are very bad consequences. So that's through Smart, smart Sparrow, and it would apply to just about any law course. That you know you've got choices. There are branches. Which choice did you make? Does it turn out it was a good choice when you get to the end of it? So John's just showing me an example. This is a very basic simulation that students can interact, and this is using smart spread technology as well. So this is a, a, a lesson, and you can embed simulations within a lesson to see oh, feedback yeah. appears as well. You put videos and feedback. 
Um, so this is the, quite a basic simulation. You can go as complex as you want or basic depending on um, what topic or subject you want to cover. Uh, so this is just one example from the engineering faculty. We also have others in the biomedical education skills and training network. So a lot of these networks uh, have been established to create um, shared resources uh, across the university with the academic staff. And so the, the, that smart sparrow there, then we can build a, a simulation in this little box, box here. We can get the students to click on things or, or do things or move things around. Let's go to the website and show you an example of a simulation. Hmm. So, so right now, with the combination of the ILA initiatives, the, we, we also have our um, funding, the faculty funding that you can also apply for, and also Patrick as a um, for the next year sitting there as a um, support for you. There's maximum support right now for um, really using your imagination and, and branching out. Um, as Kathy said, not using technology for the technology's sake, but to really um, enhance your teaching and enhance the learning of the student. Maximum support right now. And I'll just say, if, if you're someone who maybe won't be going on the ILI, but still like these ideas and you like these concepts and you want to do some level of it, we can work together with me or with Thomas or with Danny, and we can also do some of these things. Um, and also with my project, I'll be doing, the stuff I'll be working on is quite similar to the stuff, it's kind of like a parallel experience. The scale is a little bit smaller, but the ideas and the concepts and the outcomes are pretty similar, so that's another range of support available too. And, and the big thing to think, uh, to keep in your mind, I think, is you don't have to go, okay, I'm going to make some amazing game that, you know, uh, I don't even have to teach anymore, the students just go to the game and they'll be a full semester on the farms. It's not like that. It's, it's um, with Patrick, for example, you can start a really small experiment with it, uh, say summer or um, semester one next year build it a little bit more, make it more complex. So I think it's that kind of pathway rather than starting with huge ideas. Like for example, there's a few things I've been working on that I started in June and now they're pretty much ready to go. So I've been working with Mark Tony, for example, and with um, Justin Nolan. So we just started in June, we're pretty much finished. Now we're gonna do a pilot of it in S2. We'll get some feedback, we'll update it, we'll fix it up and then but yeah, if you want to do something in S2, it's not too late. Um, the scale might have to be quite small, but it's definitely if you just want to trial something, get yourself around it, just do one little thing. It's still, there's still time to do it for S2, so keep that in mind. Or for summer. Summer is a really good time to trial things. If you're teaching in summer, or you have a course in summer, it's a very good time to experiment. Any other questions, statements? <coughs> Any wrap up comments? So we look forward to all the expression of interest, so <laughs> please nominate your courses. We really want to partner with them. Um, thank you. So thanks very much for coming, guys. There's loads of food here. Thank you. Thanks.